So um, we're going to talk about Thorcolomba fractures. Before I start, I don't know if any of you guys are Premier League uh, soccer fans, but I'd like to congratulate Liverpool fans. Finally, 30 years uh, champion after uh, Man City just beat, uh, excuse me, Man City just lost to Chelsea. So um, uh, congratulations there. We always, you can't, it can't all be about spine, all right, guys? Um, so we need to uh, make sure we keep that in line. All right, so there we go. Perfect. So here are my disclosures, uh, none of relevant to this talk. All right, so let's, let's hop right into it. Um, I really hope that this is interactive. It's hard to do on, on, uh, on a Zoom call, but uh, I know we got uh, a bunch of folks here, so please uh, ask some questions if you have them. And then I'll, uh, I'll hope that this, uh, the team of surgeons here uh, on the call will interrupt me. So first case, 18-year-old student uh, uh, having a, a good day. This is when you could still be in college, uh, enjoying their day. Had, took a little bit of acid and then decided uh, to see how far they could jump. And it turns out that it's not very far. Um, otherwise healthy, has some thoracic pain, uh, maybe uh, some uh, pain around their neck. And the neurological exam has zero out of five motor strength in their hip flexors and gastroc. Is able to internally rotate uh, their left hip and maybe some light sensation in the lower extremities and has rectal tone with volitional contraction. And here are the initial x-rays. And so you can see right, left, uh, paramedian, and then uh, some axial cuts through those through that section. So who wants to help me out? Um, I don't know, Jonathan. I see you looking over there. What do you think about this? Um, big deal? Not a big deal? You know, this they love to wake me up. So the guy, you know, of course, the kid jumps at six or seven o'clock at night, but they call me at two o'clock in the morning and they say, "Hey, Dr. Clymer, here's what we got." Yeah. So uh, this is like, this is the, uh, I'm, I'm assuming this was on a Saturday night or a Friday night. The, uh... <laughs> yeah, exactly. This is, this is Saturday night. I'm just, you know, Saturday, I'm, I'm, I'm fast, fast asleep. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. This is the worst. The, the classic. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> what we see here is, I'm not sure of the exact level, but I'll just call it mid thoracic. Um, looks like a three column uh, fracture dislocation. Um, you see translation of the uh, superior uh, vertebral body. Let's just call that, I guess, T6. T6 um, uh, translated roughly about a centimeter anterior to uh, T7. There's uh, <clears throat> a tear, teardrop type fracture of T7 with a uh, uh, potential retropulsion of that fragment posteriorly. You can see that that fracture line extends through likely bilateral pedicles, goes, goes through the uh, posterior column, raising the uh, suspicion of whether or not the PLC is damaged. Almost certainly it is. So I would say if you're going to classify this based on the AO spine criteria, um, this is probably a type C or um, potentially a uh, type uh, B2, but more likely a C because you see that there's a, a, a fracture dislocation there. So I, I would just wonder um, <clears throat> what, uh, what's the patient's neurologic status? I, I think you may have mentioned that before. I missed that. I apologize. That's okay. So, so really nothing below the knees has a little internal hip rotation. Preservation of sensation to the feet and normal rectal tone. So, is that is that two o'clock in the morning? You rolling out of bed and getting that done, or do you wait till the morning? What's what do you guys do it in Cleveland? Yeah. So this incomplete injury, um, likely a type C uh, or Asia C rather. Uh, with given his age and the acuity of that trauma, it literally just happened within an hour, I assume, of his injury, maybe an hour or two. Um, we would we would take this guy uh, category one to the OR uh, for uh, for fixation and, and reduction of that of that fragment. Yeah, if, if it was Asia A and um, and uh, it had been some time or there were some uh, confounding issue, if he had poly trauma, he was totally unstable, he had other things going on, um, it becomes a little bit more of a convoluted picture. But I think this is pretty straightforward. I, I would I would take them. Can I interject here too? Yeah, I have some value as the radiologist. That was, that was excellent. I might have made it a little bit more brief if I had had a report than Dr. Rizzoli just did. Um, <laughs> that probably sounds smart. <laughs> <laughs> when, I, when I teach our residents, I, I try to get everyone to use AO spine. So I start, you know, with the, the most severe. So there's already some translation there. So that's already the most severe injury. It's got to be uh, both anterior and posterior column by nature. But aside from the spine itself, you've got a pulmonary contusion or maybe more than one, actually. I see at least two on your bottom slide. Um, 
There's an awful lot of hemorrhage too. It might all be due to that vertebral body fracture. But this, I think this is a non-con CT. I'm, I'm assuming this person would get a CTA as well, just as actually as Jonathan said. If this is a, another more severe injury, so polytrauma, you want to make sure there's not vascular injury as well here, right? Because there's other injuries that you can see just in these pictures. Is that yeah, exactly? True? <laughs> No, it's, and that's what a great point. And you can see, actually, you can see the, are, can you guys see my arrow? Yes. So you can see the contrast in the aorta. So this is a, a CTA with contrast, so we can get a sense about where there's flow. Oh, yeah. And then I love these, I love these, these plumes of pulmonary contusion, just telling you that uh, whatever the injury is here in the lungs, probably going to get worse, not better, uh, at least initially. And that's not, and that's not COVID. All right. <laughs> a little, a little COVID joke. All right, uh, so gosh, uh, amazing. So initial assessment, we'll go through. Are there any, any additional imaging you'd want to do to help make your mind about whether or not we need to do? So the CTA, we want to make sure we're going to look at other uh, uh, vascular structures. Anything else we need to do? Jonathan, what do you think? I'm going to, I'm going to stick with you because you, you did that so well. <laughs> um, I, I don't think, I, he's, he's definitely has, um, the, the question is whether or not you would do an MRI in this case. And I, I don't yeah. believe MRI would really add anything to this. Um, he, he has uh, evidence of neurologic injury. He's not he's not neurologically intact, so you're, you're very likely going to de decompress around the uh, around the fracture site. Um, the, the only the only reason I would get an MRI there is if I want to know specifically how many uh, for sure certain he has a spinal cord contusion. How many levels I would have to go up and down um, to, if I want to be very precise with my decompression on that. But then again. You know, you got to remember this is a very high acuity situation. This guy's likely unstable. Taking someone down to MRI, doing that whole thing, is such an unstable situation. He could get worse. So um, I, I, I would favor uh, to be more, you know, more of the initial management, resuscitate him, get him stabilized, take him to the OR, and I would just do it based on the CT. Perfect. And then, and then we talked a little bit about classification, I, and I got a couple slides, so I'll just kind of, kind of briefly go over stuff. But and then what about your, what about a fractured treatment plan? I mean, he's got a spinal cord contusion. He's got that bone of the canal. Should, should we go in the front and do a corpectomy and remove that, that bone and pressure? I, I would do this all posterior, um, especially all with all, posterior. Uh, all the, um, all the uh, uh, pulmonary and, and mediastinal uh, injuries that he has as well, too. I think you're, you're, you're going to, it's going to be a very difficult situation. So uh, yeah, I and what do you think? Short segment, we'll go one above, one below, a little bit lower than that, two above, two below. Um, if I could, in, I, it looked like the fracture line extended in the pedicles themselves, so I doubt you could get a screw in there. So I would favor um, a longer segment, like two, two or three above, two or three below. I love it. Gosh, you won't. I'm I keep trying to bite. I keep trying to keep trying to get you to go bite on a bite on stuff. But you can't. You you keep uh, keep sniffing away. So I love it. So. You know, I think the key thing, so it's great, uh, Wendy's doing a nice job of reorienting us, right? So the first thing is we're doctors first, surgeons second. So we want to make sure we keep maps up. Uh, we want to make sure the patient's well oxygenated. Who would give this person steroids? Anybody uh, do uh, uh, solumedrol anymore? Yeah. Looks like a resounding no. How about Decadron? Anybody give this guy a little bit of Decadron before you take him in the OR? Also, maybe some shaking of heads. You have to be really careful. I'd say that, you know, for sure, high dose steroids in this uh, kid, probably a bad idea with all of the pulmonary contusions. And so uh, the secondary effects and ARDS and a uh, risk uh, uh, is a, a huge issue. Decubitus precautions, we want to be careful. And then how fast to stabilize. And, and I agree, Jonathan, uh, uh, you know, for, for someone like this, a young kid, all the chance of recovery. This is one that I, I get out of bed in the middle of the night. And we, I think about how to fix and what we need to do. In terms of additional imaging, you know, obviously you do want to get uh, images of the whole spine. Uh, don't get so excited about that fracture of that you miss another injury in the cervical spine. I, I literally just the other day had a patient come in, fracture of uh, mid thoracic spine, but had weakness in his hand. It didn't make sense. And so we got an MRI of the upper extremity and sure enough had a huge disc herniation at C67. And so uh, we did an ACDF first to remove that disc herniation and pressure to, to get the hands back because that's the best chance he's got, and then went ahead and did the posture approach uh, for the thoracic spine. Uh, you can imagine that was a, uh, that was a, a long evening. But so, so the key thing is think about the exam. 
and don't miss stuff if you need to. It, MRI in this patient, Jonathan, again, I, I, it's so hard to argue with you on any of this stuff, but I wouldn't bother with this patient because I think the key here is get this patient taken care of quickly. We want to decompress the canal in that area. And most importantly, the best, the best decompression you do is an appropriate realignment. And so um, that's, that's really the an A plus job. And then the decompression, taking, the, taking the, the pressure off the canal, that helps, but the reduction is the key part. Uh, you want to think about the soft tissue of the canal, disc, ligamentum, flavum, hematoma, like you talked about. Um, and then when there's a lack of correlation between that radiographic injury and neurologic level, uh, uh, like that case that, that, that I just had. Classifications, there are a gazillion of them. And, you know, I, I think the key thing is you want something simple, you want something reproducible, and perhaps something that guides treatment or predicts that outcomes. And so, you know, I would like ones that talk about the mechanism, mechanism of injury, the spinal stability, and then give me a sense about neurologic function. And ideally, one that does all of the above. So mechanical stability, neurologic, uh, obviously ability to main neurologic uh, uh, function. And, and here are all the classifications we have. So um, uh, this is in 1949 and all the way up to 2005. And, um, and just to go through a couple of these, uh, you kind of mentioned them. So it's the three column model looking at anterior, middle and posterior column. Uh, these are the, the ones that describe the injuries. So these are flexion distraction injuries or fracture dislocation. I think that was the first thing that came out of your mouth, Jonathan, you, as you said, boy, there's a fracture dislocation by definition means that every column has been injured. Um, I still think that there is real value in this classification. Helps you understand what was going on and how severe it is. Um, instability is defined as disruption of two of the three columns. We know that's not totally right. Uh, we also look at secondary markers of ligamentous instability, including loss of height, canal compromise, and kyphosis. Additionally, there's an AL classification, and I think uh, Wendy, you already mentioned this, that you like to uh, have your residents think about the AO classification. Um, and it's really divided into three parts, the A's, the B's, and the C's. A's are compression-type fractures. B are extension-type fractures, and then C are these fracture dislocations. And Again, the C's are unstable, the B's are mostly unstable, and the A's are mostly stable. And so those kind of help you think about it. And they're all subdivided, A1, 2's, and 3's, based on the amount of combination and instability. And so as you get uh, the uh, larger letter and a larger number, you need to think more about stabilization and correction. The AO uh, classification additionally also has a neurologic component and then some modifiers. Um, but the key thing here is it really focuses on intact, ridiculous com opponent up to complete spinal cord injury. So these are useful, I think, mostly in describing like and like uh, uh, fractures um, and can be helpful when they think about treatment. I think TLIX is, is probably the mainstay of classifications that help us think about um, treatment. And so it gives a, a number uh, to uh, the injury morphology the ligamentous integrity in the neurologic exam to help us understand who would and who wouldn't operate on it. And the only, my only criticism of this is this is not randomized prospective data. What this was is essentially a, a, a classification that helped you understand what the experts would do. Um, and unfortunately, every time you're not sure what to do and you calculate it, you get a number four which really lets you do operative or not non-operative management. I don't know if that's a good thing because then you can do whatever you want or if it's a bad thing because maybe it doesn't tell you what the right answer is. Um, and the key thing here I think is, is the higher scores go for things that make you want to operate the most. So for example, incomplete cord injury gets the highest score you can, caught equinus syndrome, highest score you can. Again, not in, in severity of injury, but in, uh, uh, in as a marker of how badly or how quickly you want to intervene surgically. And so kind of an interesting. The Asia exam, and I think Jonathan mentioned this, is critical when we think about uh, looking at injuries and uh, understanding how they're going to improve. And so he correctly defined them as an incomplete spinal cord injury. So, uh, and uh, level C, so had some motor function preserved, but it's useless motor. So there's a grade threes or left. He could only internally rotate one of his legs. And so that's someone where we have nothing but, but uh, ability to gain function. We know that the cord is intact because there's still some sensation below. Uh, and with a bulbar cavernosis intact or the, the rectal tone intact, we know that they're out of spinal shock. And so this is someone who has a devastating neurologic injury that we can uh, uh, intervene with quickly and early. And so if we put that all together, 
And so uh, again, um, here's the images. You can see that subluxation. You can see that injury. We call it a type C fracture. Um, uh, A2, N3, so neurologically uh, injured, uh, and an Asia C. And so this is this is one where we want to intervene early uh, and think about getting this fixed. The goals of treatment. So we talked a little bit about timing, posterior fixation, interposterior decompression. Uh, how would you do the decompression? Do you do laminectomy? Do you do a transpedicular approach? Um, uh, Jonathan, I'll, 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 I'm going to just torture you the whole way through this on, on this one. <laughs> um, in, in this case, I think uh, I would want to see how well he reduces on the table. Um, I think that I have a feeling that he would reduce very well just by positioning him prone. Um, any, any tricks to that? Do you do, you do a rotisserie? Do you do a, one of these flip tables? Do you yeah. put him on a, a bolster? How, 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 do you, how do you think about that? Yeah, th this I would, I would definitely um, rotisserie him. I wouldn't, I wouldn't flip him um, without extreme precautions because he's, he's critically unstable. He's incomplete. He could definitely, definitely deteriorate just with that maneuver itself. So I would uh, be very careful, position him supine, um, and, then, uh, and then do the rotisserie, yeah. Do you, you do neuromonitoring for this? Yes, we, we, we routinely use neuromonitoring for these cases. For, uh, and, for these and you, would, you, would you get pre-positioned neuromonitoring? Does that help you, or does that change the way you do things, or does that matter? Um, ideally, if, if we're able to do that, it only adds maybe five or 10 minutes. So um, we, we would be able to, if time was of the essence and the patient was getting more and more unstable, then uh, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't do that. We would just go ahead and continue. Okay, great. I, I love it. And I, I, I love getting pre-flip pre motors, uh, pre-flip exams, because it's very difficult to know what you have. And if I take this guy and I put him prone and we have no signals when we start the case, I don't know if I did it. And so did I hurt him by flipping or were they just not there? Um, it also is great for medical legal documentation. So um, if, if you, again, you have no choice but to put this guy prone. You have no choice but to do it as safely and as carefully as you can. If that's a rotisserie bread, that's great. If it's max assist log roll, that's okay too in my mind. But the key thing is that uh, you've documented and thought about how to make that as safe as you can for this patient to make sure you're not going to injure him. And uh, J uh, Jonathan, again, I mean, it's, you're too good at this, but um, <laughs> if I put a bolster right here in the chest, it's going to press this fracture back and help me reduce it beautifully. And so that's a, a very nice, slick way to get this reduced well. You can also put them on the, um, uh, on the gel rolls that bolster up. Um, I'm blanking on the name right now, not uh, on, the, on the Wilson frame. And so sometimes if they've got a lot of kyphosis, you can use that Wilson frame and I'll kind of jack that up and get it to get, give me the right kyphosis, particularly for like an AS fracture or something like that. So that can also be a nice trick. And so we want to decompress, realign and stabilize just like you talked about. And here we go, I go multiple levels above and below. We want to put nice big long screws. I like monoaxial screws if possible uh, because those allow me to reduce things to the fracture. I'm less of a stickler for it in the thoracic spine because I just want to get it aligned. But if I'm doing short segment, then I really like monoaxial screws. And so we uh, did a Jackson flip and uh, rotated them on. I did not uh, do the whole um, uh, uh, rotisserie thing. Uh, we did the rods connected and then used the rods with a rod reducer to press them down to help re reduce that fracture. And then that decompression is done through that realignment. You can see this post-op CT scan with uh, a restoration of the canal shape, the canal diameter. Um, we're able to do that all posteriorly and fixate it nicely and do that in the middle of the night, in the middle of the night, which is nice and safe for this guy. <laughs> and then at discharge, you can see this is one thing that the resident, the residents don't get to see is this great neurologic recovery for these patients. And so, uh, and on discharge, he's got fours, uh, fours out of fives in his lower extremity, a couple of threes in his DHL. But you know, at four to six months post-op, he's coming in with a cane. He's got some clonus. Uh, but he's able to go to the bathroom on his own. He's able to walk on his own. And this is really a huge win for this young man and uh, getting back to college and back to his life. So, Eric, that's I a great that, case. Uh, this Ali, sorry to interject. That's a great case. I, I have a question it. about the uh, decompression by realignment. In these cases where they're incomplete, uh, let's say there is potentially a hematoma or something else there. Are you confident all the time that you're able to decompress with just realignment? Oh, and when would you actually perform a, 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 a true laminectomy in these cases? 
Yeah, and so I, the, I think that it is, I th really do think that the reduction is the key, most important part. And so by getting the spine realigned, you do the best job of, re of reducing the, the compression. I think you have to look at what the fracture looks like too. And so if there, if it's a total explodo with little pieces all over the place, then reducing it isn't gonna pull those things back in. And so that's one that makes me wanna be more aggressive with the decompression. Um, if we had poor signals throughout the case, that would be one that I'd be more aggressive about a decompression. Um, and a lot of times when you go in to do this, quite frankly, they'll have a fracture through the lamina and that lamina is just about uh, falling apart, in which case then I have a low threshold to do that decompression. Um, but you do have to be careful because uh, you can decompress it and open that up and all of a sudden you're looking at a large dural leak and a CSF tear and then you need to think about primary repair or putting a lumbar drain and uh, you've taken a fairly simple problem and made it a lot more complicated without potentially making a huge difference for this young man. Hey, Eric, that's a, that's a great case. I have a question for you. You know, uh, these situations, you know, I think uh, using monitoring, what do you do? Like, let's say, you know, you've examined that patient and uh, they've got some function there in their legs and their feet, you know, uh, where they can activate, but then they put them to sleep and they have not paralyzed the patient, but their motors are just like non-existent, you know, some sensories, you know, but not much to go on. You know, what's your strategy there? Do you just sort of go for it? Do you wake the patient back up? This is before even positioning, you know, um, you know, yeah. sometimes we have those situations where the motors are just horrible, you know, and uh, d d at that point, do you just rip off the leads and continue or do you keep them on or what's your strategy? Uh, well, so I'll, I'll start with the end first. So I definitely keep the leads on because because uh, they're already on. There's no harm in leaving them in place and continue to monitor throughout the case. I, you know, it depends on the kind of sur a kind of case that you're doing. So this is a not elective surgery. So it doesn't it, the 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 neural monitoring is for documentation, medical legal documentation, and it's to help me protect myself during the case to make sure that nothing gets worse. Um, if they're terrible to start off with, well, that means that you're doing the right thing by taking the person to the operating room. And so I, I would say carry on. If it's an elective case, if it's a, a, a decompression and, or a, um, a deformity that, that for whatever reason, the, the positioning uh, gives you problems or it surprises you, so you should have normal signals and then you don't, then those things tell me, gosh, you know what? This guy moved his legs ahead of time. Now, he's, now we, I, everything's telling me he's not. I'm going to do a decompression around that canal. I'm going to take another look there to help make sure that I've done everything I can. Um, you know, one of the one of the tricks that um, that I was shown in Cleveland when I did my fellowship was using an ultrasound to look at the spinal cord to make sure it's decompressed thoroughly. Um, getting intraoperative imaging additionally to make sure that you decompress things thoroughly. So I, all those little things can clue you in that wait a second, this isn't this is more than I think it is. What do you do, John? Yeah, I mean, I, I I I feel the same way. I mean, I think if it's an elective case, like a bad deformity or something like that, I mean, I'll I'll wake the patient up or lighten them up so I can see them move again before I continue uh, positioning or whatnot. I think in a case like this, I mean, I think it happens. Tumor, trauma, you know, they they're just horrible, you know. And um, yeah. I had a case like that uh, earlier today, and it was just like I, I just decided we just keep moving, you know. Um, yep. And, you know, the residents always ask, it's like, well, you didn't, you seem pretty chill about it. Like, how do you, how did you know just to continue versus, you know, uh, you know, um, to abort, you know? And uh, I think you're right. I, th I think it's the situation really uh, says a lot, whether it's core compression from tumor or trauma. The, 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 John, you're a cool customer. Part of it is your blood pressure never gets above 80. So you're <laughs> just, right? Listen, no big deal. I got this. Everyone relax. But I, I agree with you. I think the answer is you got to do the job, um, stopping and waiting around to do a wake-up test for a patient like this who's clearly neurologically injured, doesn't make any sense. Get on with it. Get the surgery done. The best thing you can do is operate on this. I wouldn't say quickly operate, but do it efficiently. Yeah. All right, yeah. good. Should we keep going? You want some more cases? I'm not asking Jonathan yeah, any more sure. questions. That was great. Make I'm not asking Jonathan any more questions because he makes the, the case go too quickly because he knows all the right answers. All right, so uh, just again, so summary, type C injuries, all unstable, uh, high incidence of neurodeficit and risk of deterioration, so you want to take these to the operating room. Um, think about uh, the severe, the severe structural instability. Uh, like Jonathan said, 
treatment is posterior, that's absolutely the way to go. If, if you fix it all posteriorly and there's still some compression, uh, you could think about a, a, a revision anterior approach or anterior colpectomy down the road, but uh, that ought to definitely be a secondary procedure, not your primary choice. So, um, all right, good. All right, next case. So, um, 45 year old guy, um, he's in an aircraft and he crashes his airplane out here in Sacramento. In Sacramento, they've got, we've got these airplanes that do all the, the, the spraying for mosquitoes. And so this thing hit a downdraft and it plowed straight into, it went straight into a field. So he comes in, his motor exam, he's got three to five in his bilateral low extremities. He's got dysesthetic pain. He can't void spontaneously, so they quickly put a Foley in him in the ER. He has no bulbar cavernosis or rectal tone, no step off. Uh, and he's got a fair bit of a pain when we palpate his lower back. And here's what his initial x-rays look like. So who wants, who wants this one? Who should I torture? Who? John. Um, that looks pretty bad. Well, I mean, try to try to make some mistakes so that so that so we can you know have some interaction here. I don't. Well, I can make, I can make a lot of mistakes. Sure. <laughs> um, so this looks like five, four, three, two. It's an L one fracture. Uh, looks like it's, it has a burst type component to it. Um, alignment looks okay on the CT scanner from what I from from this image, but it has that appearance where there looks to be a retropulse portion of that retrieval body into the canal. That's always a little um, unsettling to see. Um, maybe some widening of the pedicles there. Severe canal compromise. Yeah, right where you're pointing to. Um, did you, I'm sorry if I missed it, but what's the uh, neurological functional status of the patient? Dysesthetic pain in his legs and three out of five strength throughout. Yeah. So, um, I don't know. I think with a, you know, I think with definite neurologic impairment, uh, I would think about just taking this patient to the operating room. Uh, I personally would not get an MRI, but I know that others may feel differently. Um, so I don't know. Would, would anyone else get an MRI in this situation? Look for something. It seems like that's the only injury. Yeah, John. This is uh, Ali. Uh, you know, we so Eric. We last. Uh, uh, a few days ago, we had a session on cervical trauma, and this is our follow-up thoracic lumbar trauma, and that question also came up a lot uh, as far as getting an MRI. And I think, you know, my, I'll, I'll give you my take on this, see what the other faculty hosts think and the audience think, but I feel like when I was in training, which wasn't too long ago, but it was still long enough, about a decade or so, we used to just take patients straight to the OR with a CAT scan, and that was sufficient. I feel that now in a lot of major institutions, it has become so uh, readily available and so expeditious. The patient's literally getting an MRI before we're even called, like from the ED. So I feel naturally we're getting a lot of MRIs just as a, honestly from the ED, from the orders of the ED doctors and the trauma doctors before we're even consulted. So um, I think it's institution dependent. It's what's safest and quickest for the patient. But I would say in a lot of major medical centers now, uh, the MRI is becoming uh, uh, almost part of the protocol for a lot of these fractures, including our current, uh, you know, including Cornell, uh, these patients are all getting MRIs. But that's a paradigm shift compared to when I was in training, and that's, that's just what I'm seeing. Is there something there that you would expect or something that you're looking for, maybe? I'll, I'll just play devil's advocate, you know? Like, yeah. are you, it's so compromised there, what are you gonna see that's gonna change your operative management? Yeah, John, I'm with you 100%. I used to see, you know, when I was in training in South Florida, we used to see two or three burst fractures a week from motorcycle accidents and motor vehicle accidents, and they're all the same. You know you have to reduce the fracture. You know you have to decompress, stabilize, either front or back. And the MRI really didn't add much value. Uh, but, but again, I think that in a lot of institutions, it's, it's just changing, and, and people are getting uh, MRIs very quickly uh, before even neurosurgery or spine is consulted. I don't know what others feel and how, how it's done in their institution, but I think our, my current residents would be surprised if I take a patient to the OR without an MRI, uh, yeah. actually, which is very different than how I train. What do the others feel? And I, I would like to interject there, too, because I think people who are saying in the chat that, you know, MRIs are fast and they're easy, they're actually not, because you need to screen the patients. It takes time to get them there. You're actually moving the patient. You need the patient to stay still. 
there's a lot that goes into it. It's not as easy as people think. And a person like this, who's got, you know, a complete burst, which is what this should be with the, like John said, the, what, severe canal compromise, less than half of that canal that's obviously compressing the conus. I'm not sure what value that would add in this patient that would change your management. So I would say whenever you can get away with not, you should, because you could injure this patient more. We were talking about ankylosing spondylitis the other day. You can definitely always hurt a person by doing more to them. So if you can get away with not doing it, I would, just from our side at least, I would recommend that. We don't want them to get more hurt on our, in our scanners. You should. Yeah, I, yeah, I totally agree. And I think that I know that, you know, at least, you know, there's one school of thought that maybe the MRI can pick up some ligamentous injury. I don't know what you think about that, Wendy, but I just feel like in these cases, everything lights up on T2 or STIR or whatever fancy sequence you may have at your respective hospital. <laughs> I don't, know how, I don't know how I mean, reliable I that is. You know? know the answer to this already. So I'm just going to, okay, I want to go, I want to see how I would say this case, not because I'm trying to show off, because I want to know if this is useful to Dr. Kleinberg and all of you, the way I'm trying to teach our people how to say this, because people describe it very randomly in reports. And I, my big thing is trying to get everybody to say the same thing and very briefly, so that when you see the impression of a report, two lines tells you what you need to know before you even see the images or the patient. So when I go through this, again, I've used the AO spine. We know it's not, there's no translation, so we know it's not a C. We know it's not um, an either a posterior or an anterior column hyperflexion, hyperextension, where that, you know, there's no splaying back here. We know it's not um, interspinous ligament injury. We know it's not widening in the front, so it's not hyperextension. Um, so this is an A type, and we know that it's a complete burst. The posterior cortex is disrupted. Top and bottom end plate are disrupted. And again, like you're saying, a lot of canal compromise. So by nature, I don't think any of the posterior column ligaments are going to be injured here, just by how you would think about this mechanism. Anterior longitudinal ligament, I think, would be lifting up the soft tissues. You'd see a little bit more hemorrhage in the front. Um, not for sure. You could have some disc injury, but they don't look as bad as some that you would see. So I think you can even reason it out without the MRI in terms of ligaments. Now that's, that's being a little cavalier maybe, but that's um, that you just mentioned ligament. So that is how I would approach that. And again, I would just, I would put that, you know, A4, uh, complete burst, 50% height loss, 50% canal compromise at that level due to retropulsion at the level of the conus. And hopefully that is something that the surgeons will find interesting. If the ER doctor's calling them, they read that, you guys know what it means right away without reading like a paragraph of whatever you usually might see in a radiology report. So sorry, I'd be on my soapbox because I don't get to say this very often, but um, what do you think, Dr. Kleinberg, is that useful? I think, Wendy, I think you're hired. If you want to come to California, you please let me know. Yes. I, I, yeah, I, so that's, I mean, gosh, that's perfect. Um, I, I, this is, so I don't, I, I agree with all the comments. I think that for a neurologically intact patient where I have all the time in the world, an MRI may be useful. Uh, because then I have some time and perhaps that helps me think about another injury that I might be missing. I think for someone that is has some deficits that I'm for sure going to operate on, I'm not sure it really does anything other than delay me. Um, and so I'm not sure that that makes a big difference. I, I love this image of the, of the fracture because this is such a classic fracture fragment uh, where this posterior die punch. Um, and there, there are typically these sinusoidal uh, veins that run on both sides. It's kind of like a, a postage stamp is how I think about it. And this piece gets naturally pressed into the canal. And this is a, this is a classic, classic, uh, uh, just like you've described, A4 burst fracture. All right. Uh, keep going. All right, keep going. So conus medullator syndrome. So uh, uh, we talked about it a little bit. I think that was one of the first things out of John's uh, mouth. And so it can be a, a mix of upper and lower motor neuron signs. It, this is a classic burst location. So T12, L1. Uh, because of the, the this relatively rigid thoracic spine and then flexible lumbar spine. Um, and if you have an injury in the conus, you can have a real uh, a neuro, a neurologic dysfunction, particularly in the sphincter um, and uh, uh, the urinary tract uh, with significant radicular pain and numbness around the, the anus, even with relatively normal neurologic functional legs. And so be careful with this. I would also tell you that if Patients recover neurologically and they've got good strength in their legs and they're still walking around with a Foley bag. They are not very happy. And so this is a, a really a devastating injury for a lot of patients. 
Um, as again, Wendy all is already not the thing out of the park, and so this is a, obviously an A type fracture with a disruption of the anterior column. Um, it is an A4 by definition because the top and bottom are disrupted. Um, it does not have any uh, posterior fracture to it, uh, but does have a fair, fair amount of combination and disruption anteriorly with the, uh, that classic neural compression and neural deficits. And so, again, if we classify this, this is a L1. Uh, A4 burst fracture with an uh, incomplete N3 neurologic uh, injury. And so just like we talked about, so that's perfect. And so our treatment options, so we can think about a lot of different things to do here. John, what, what are our options? What can we do? What do you think? Yeah, I think this is, uh, I think this is tough. I mean, I think I, I, I personally, um, I always struggle with, uh, doing this anteriorly alone versus all posteriorly versus a combined anterior and posterior approach, you know. Um, I, I definitely, and this is all anecdotal, and I know uh, you may be going into what the literature says or what, you know, what people would do, but um, I've had situations where I've done this anteriorly alone and they're perfectly fine. Young, healthy people, uh, single level corpactomy and instrumentation from the front, uh, taking that down, you know, plus or minus a CSF leak, um, you know, but then I've also had patients uh, where we've done that and the graphs of sides or telescopes through the vertebral body above without posterior fixation and also had some with uh, maybe a uh, unidentified fracture and the posterior elements were unrealized and end up doing a front back. So I think it's tough. I mean, honestly, I think it's, uh, if it's a young, healthy person, I might just do this from the front uh, in sort of like a minimal access way. Um, but uh, I think it, it really sort of depends on uh, a number of factors that uh, makes it a little more complicated in my mind. You know, I don't have a knee jerk sort of um, approach to these type of fractures. Good, I love it. Well, I think that's probably the right answer, right? It, 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 like, like, uh, like fixation for most things, it depends. And so I was just kind of going through this thinking, okay, listen, I, I need an MRI, uh, any other studies. And, and we guys, we kind of went, went through that and talked about management. There, there was an MRI taken, so here's an MRI. Ali, you're smiling, so uh, you get your MRI. And like Wendy showed, Wendy, you show up. And so here, it looks perfect, right? That was poster ligamentous. So in fact, in terms of classification, this really doesn't help us very much. It corroborates what we see, which is that the conus is pretty badly injured and compressed here. Anything I missed, Wendy? I love it. So, you know, there's there's a lot of different options like John talked about. We can do a posterior approach. Uh, great news, we're familiar with it. We know how to get there. We can get there by ourselves. I don't need a buddy. Um, but it can be hard to see. And sometimes we can see CSF leaks or it can be bloody and tough to work around ventrally to see everything that we need to see. And then again, it's maybe not addressing where the problem is. If we have no posterior ligamentous injury, then really we're going in the only part of the spine that hasn't been injured. Does that make sense? Um, the anterior approach is great, but we can look at the canal, we can restore the height, short segment fuse, but it can be difficult. It can be a corpactomy, it can be a lot of blood loss, it can be disorienting, particularly when that bone is really packed posteriorly into the canal. Um, and if you have a coronal deformity, it can be difficult. And, and like John said, you can also have this, um, this settling. There, there is a great paper that I would encourage people to take a look at. It's, it's McCormick and Gaines, and it talks about when you can do short segment fixation, really looking at the amount of combination. And so I, I try to look at this. If I see a vertebral body that's totally blasted, then I'm thinking about either anterior column support or I'm thinking about a longer posterior construct. These are the ones where the single, uh, single level posterior constructs typically will fail or they will fall into kyphosis. So those are the ones I'm wary of. Uh, and so it, it helps maybe make that decision between a, a short segment versus a long segment, and then push me a little bit more towards doing an anterior approach. Here, here are the options, non-op. I don't think, I I'm, I'm, can't get any of you guys to bite on non-op, I bet. So what we can do is we could do an anterior corpectomy like John suggested with a, a short segment anterior fusion. Uh, we could do a short posterior fusion, maybe a little bit risky with that amount of combination. We could do a long posterior fixation, um, uh, again, disadvantage is there, or maybe we're, we're burning up some of his lumbar spine. We could do both. And so I, and I always tell my residents, right, you got spine is great. You got three options. You can do anterior posterior, you can do both. 
Um, and so uh, those are always the right answer. Or we could think about some sort of anterior plus percutaneous stabilization. So I think that there are really a multitude of options to help you decide. This is what we chose to do. I did an anterior approach. I did a corpectomy. There's a corpectomy cage and then removed all the pressure off the posterior aspect of the canal. I like this and people that have neurologic deficits, um, there are some good, there is some good literature out of Cleveland and from Henry Bowman looking at corpectomies of the cervical spine where removing all of that bone and canal uh, does make the biggest difference. And you can really look at the entire canal removing all that bone from stem to stern An expandable cage is a nice way to restore your height. And with the ligaments in the back, it kind of tensions itself. So it really makes it easy to open things up and clean it out nicely. Um, and they can uh, uh, go together nicely. First factors without neurologic deficits. Uh, again, I don't need to t preach to John about this. This is in your backyard um, uh, with Kirk Wood. And so we know that there's no major long-term advantage to operative versus non-operative management. Uh, and in fact, there's no difference in terms of non-operative for kyphosis, canal compromise, return to work, maybe all the outcomes that we really care about, except for one, which is that if we operate, we have more complications associated with surgery. So um, there certainly are non-operative uh, burst fractures that do very, very well, particularly without neuro deficits. Um, in terms of uh, TL fractures, obviously you need to think about the injury. Most fractures without deficits can be treated conservatively, um, but if not, then you want to think about some sort of fixation strategy for them. In terms of an algorithm, I'm just going to give you my quick algorithm, and I'm not going to, it's definitely not perfect, but at least it'll give you a place to start off with. And so if, um, if a patient comes in with, a, with that injury, and they come in at, at uh, uh, seven o'clock in the morning, I'm gonna do an inter only approach. I can get an access surgeon or I can do a lateral approach by myself uh, with a minimally invasive retractor and uh, resect everything and do a great job. At midnight, if that comes in, I'm gonna do a poster short segment approach and I'm gonna fixate it and I will likely bring them back to do an answer at some other time. In the middle of the night, I don't really wanna be messing around with who's got the retractor and who my help is and what, where all the things are. I wanna keep it simple. So in the evening, people get the simplest operation that I can muster. If, there, if this guy was older or sicker, then I have a very low threshold of doing a long segment poster fixation to multiple levels. Again, I feel bad that the patient got in an accident, but I didn't get them in the accident. Um, and so I want to make sure I get stability, protect the neurologic elements, and I can always go back and do a corpactomy at a later date. Um, and oftentimes I get surprised. We'll, we'll re restore the height, we'll hold things together. And then a couple of days later, they have a hard time removing the Foley and there's still little compression. And we can go back and do a corpectomy electively. They can they get on and off the table. They stay in the hospital another day or so, and it's really not a big deal. So I, I think you've got a lot of different options on how to treat this successfully. Um, and the key thing is neuro deficits, take the pressure off the canal. You guys making fun of me? Now we're, we're having a very dynamic discussion on the chat, uh, Eric. Uh, Eric, I absolutely love your, your, your protocol. I, I do have a question that I also put in the chat box. What if that, so that's my baby there, that's her voice. What if that <laughs> same, she wants to chime in. What if that same patient uh, was intact? With that severity of burst fracture, I think that's the one that throws off some people is you have a really bad burst fracture, a lot of pain, but the patient's intact. And I can tell you that just for me personally, that's when I change my strategy to an MIS approach. So maybe short segment fixation, MIS decompression when they're intact and I don't need to do a significant decompression. But I want to know your thoughts on that. How would you treat that patient if they were intact? Yeah, I think that's, it's, it's a good question and a difficult one. You know, the, I would say if that was not an A4, if that's an A3 and doesn't have both the, the superior and inferior end plate disrupted, I might be more inclined to treat that non-operatively. The A4s are a different animal. Um, that, the only thing holding that spine together are the two discs, and they're just sitting in between this mush of bone. And so I think with that amount of combination, I think the likelihood this falls into kyphosis is very high, and the rate of then late neurologic sequelae is dangerous. These are not the, the, the stable fractures that Kirkwood looked at. So you have to be careful. Most of the Kirkwood fractures that he looked like were, were A2s or A3s, 
that had uh, end plate, even had some canal compromise, but they did not have disruption above and below um, those end plates. So I, I think it is, it's always appropriate. I would say also with a neurologically intact patient, you're not forced to make a decision right away. I, I also think it's okay, put them in a brace and sit them up and see what they look like. If you put them in a brace and they get up and they can't mobilize because they're in so much pain, you have your answer. And so I use kind of the, right, that's a little bit of the gnomes, uh, um, you know, tumor uh, classification. But I say, boy, if the, the stability, neural, you know, preserving stability is about making sure that they can mobilize, making sure they've got good pulmonary function, making sure they protect the neural elements. If they can't do those things, then they need an operation to be stabilized. I, MIS open, I, I think it's totally dealer's choice, uh, but the key thing is they, they need to protect themselves. That was, that, was, that was perfect, Eric. Thanks so much. And I, and I really love what you just said here at the end. And we do have several uh, students and trainees with us on the call. And, and I tell all my residents the same exact thing. If you want to treat something non-operatively, make sure they get an upright x-ray before they leave the ED, especially for cervical facet fractures, for thoracolumbar facet fractures. I want to make sure their alignment is okay before they leave the ED in a brace if we're going to treat it non-operatively. So I'm really glad you, you pointed that out. And then you have to follow them closely. It is a lot more work to treat things non-operatively than operatively. And so, right, uh, uh, and for sure, all the orthopedists know it. We treat these pediatric fractures or tibia fractures non-operatively. You've got to see them every week, and it's cast and recast and fairly painful. Should we try to, uh, you want me to blow through this last case? I love it. See, you didn't think I was going to get to three. All right. 18 year old, this is great because, because it brings all the things you just talked about in, in, the, in the effect. 18 year old, young man, motor vehicle accident, has pain in his back, comes in neurologically intact. This is, this is Ali, this is your patient. He, he can uh, uh, avoid spontaneously. Uh, he was unable to avoid, so they did place a Foley. He's got no step offs, but he's got a fair amount of pain in his back. And here are his initial x rays or CT scans. And so, He's got a couple levels, so he's got some avulsion fractures at a couple levels. And then he has this kind of A3-ish, maybe with a little bit of posterior element. I'd love to hear what Wendy thinks about this. And so, uh, right, this is a little bit of a tweener. Wendy, what do you think? I agree, that's, this is one, that's a little bit harder. And I can't really tell in the posterior elements, I think on, on these, pictures. I don't see a fracture of them on these pictures for sure. It's a little widening, but I don't know. I don't know if I pulled the trigger on that. Yeah. So, so maybe this is maybe one neurological attack. Maybe we would all say, gosh, an MRI starts to make a little bit more sense on this, on this type of injury to help us decide about surgery or not surgery. So I measured, he's, you know, laying down, he's got about 16 degrees of kyphosis. He does have that loss of height. Again, it makes us think about that dentist classification. He's got a very minimal amount of intrusion in the canal, but I'm not really worried about that. So here, here we go. Here are our options. I need an MRI before I can do anything. I want to treat him non-operatively, so I'm going to put him in a brace. Maybe I don't even want to brace him, right? I think there's a lot of people saying non-op fractures don't need a brace. I want to do a corpectomy because you just saw I can, I'm super good at corpectomy. Um, I want to put a bunch of screws in. I want to put a little bit of screws. I want to do interposter or I'm going to do some percutaneous stabilization. So who wants this one? Ali, you want this one? Sure, happy to. Yeah, I mean, I, I like this case. To me, you're right. Sometimes these compression fractures are tricky because they may look like compression, but they're actually a chance type fracture with a little bit of flexion. So um, I would err on the safe side uh, with these. You know, I don't think I personally need an MRI here, but again, we're getting them. We're, they're getting done before we're even called. And I think this would be a great case for a, a percutaneous stabilization in an intact patient. Um, I would feel uh, more confidently if I stabilize them percutaneously and I won't put them in a brace. And uh, somebody asked, do I remove the perk screws later? It just depends on the, which segment of the spine. Uh, but that's what I would do. I definitely would not recommend an anterior approach for this. I love it. A anybody else have any, anything they would add? I would um, try to get a uh, s some sort of axial uh, AP lateral uh, standing X-ray just to kind of see what this guy looks like uh, when he's um, when he's standing up. That's the only thing I would. Uh, that's the one thing I would add to this. But otherwise, I, I totally agree with Ali. I think it's a great case for perks. I love it. So uh, so we ended up not getting an MRI, but 
you know, like, like Ali, we've got a lot of uh, residents and fellows and they said, hey, what about treating this guy non-op? So I said, sure. So let's put him in a brace and stand him up and see what he looks like. And unfortunately here, and I'll get, Wendy's gonna correct me if I'm wrong, but looks like more kyphosis, maybe a little bit more splaying of these posterior elements. And so this tells me what the MRI is gonna show me already. Um, and in fact, he had loads of pain sitting up. So even sitting up in his brace, he's a pretty stoic 18 year old kid. And he's like, listen, I can't, that's, that's killing me. It hurts a lot. And in fact, if you pressed on his back, you could feel a little bit more step off and, and kind of bogginess in that, in those posterior elements. And so we then said, you know what, we, we, I don't want to keep bracing him. We're going to need to think about a fixation. And so uh, for me, this is a great short segment fixation case. He's an 18 year old. He's got bomber bone, and so this, these things are absolutely cement. For these, I like a, 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 a solid fixation, so these are uh, monoblock screws. I do like putting a short segment screw within the fracture. Usually, I can find a pedicle that, that will work, and this is my classic construct, so it'll have three on the right and two on the left with, with no screw on the left, um, uh, on the left uh, a pedicle, and the reason is, is that if I ever have to do a corpectomy on this, I don't want to take a burr out and start cutting metal. And so this allows me to do a left-sided approach to easily do a corpectomy if necessary. And again, the likelihood in this is incredibly low, but there are a lot of, you know, I use these as teaching um, moments for my fellows as, and residents as well. And I say, boy, we're going to leave this out so we can get in there if we ever have to. And so this is what it looks like um, immediately. And so Ali, what do you think? What do you think this is going to look like in two years? Increasing kyphosis, increasing problems? Yeah, I mean, I absolutely love these pictures. I love the index level screw. Uh, we studied it back in the day, and the index level screw actually adds stability in a short construct. It turns out it doesn't do much if you're going two or three levels above and below, but it adds a lot for a short segment fixation. And I think this young kiddo is going to do absolutely phenomenal. I, I love this strategy. Can I ask a question? Say this was an 18-year-old yeah. girl instead of boy, and who didn't eat very much and was osteopenic, like so many people are now. Would you do the same? Would that vertebral body keep compressing and your hardware is going to fail eventually? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a good question. Uh, you know, I, I would do the same. Uh, even even an 18 year, old, 18 year old boy or girl, even with some osteopenia, even with an eating disorder, their bone is still awesome. Um, and so it's, it's shades of great. And so I, I would, st I would still do the same thing. i there's a couple times where I've taken some burst fractures like this. Uh, uh, maybe if you guys invite me back, I'll show you where I've I'll access the pedicle and I'll, I'll put a bone tamp in here. And what I'll do is I'll take out allograph and I'll fill up this entire fracture fragment back with bone. And it looks like a normal vertebral body again, as a way to augment that fixation. Kind of a, um, that's my, I, that's my trick that I use every now and again. But it's kind of a cool way to give that middle segment that inter support, and that ultimately is the risk here, right? It's that this inter column, it doesn't have enough integrity with these screws to hold things in place. And then just for, for uh, you know, again, durability. So this is what this thing looks like at a year post-op, and he looks great and held together nicely and uh, no kyphosis, um, excellent alignment, and the kid came back to him, back flips, and you, you could never tell that anything was done to him. It's kind of kind of good to be a kid. So I think I've got uh, four minutes. So I, I'm, I'm doing my best to keep on time. So, you know, in conclusions for, for all these fractures, I think the key thing is uh, make sure you understand the, the fracture and the fracture fixation options. Um, you have lots of different classifications. Uh, the reason you have a lot is because none of them are perfect. And so you have to use little bits of them to help you understand uh, what matters for your patients. Um, the key thing for me for surgical management is really understanding that posterior ligament's integrity. Um, you can get MRIs, and uh, Ali is absolutely right that as it becomes more and more common. You can get upright x-rays that can give you a sense about the integrity. You can even, I know this is going to be crazy, you can even do an exam and touch a patient. I, I'm, I, this is, I, I don't want to, I'll go out on a limb here. And you can actually feel and palpate their back and you can feel step offs or bogginess or increased pain. And that tells you that that ligament has been disrupted and injured. Um, the key thing determining surgical management is the neurostatus. And that really forces me. So if I see people that have neurologic deficits, those are the ones I want to operate. 
Um, Kirkwood really uh, showed us that a lot of these can be braced and treated non-operatively, and so don't forget that. And short segment fixation, particularly with young patients, minimal combination of gray bone is a really nice option. Allows them to get back to their lives with, and and hopefully they can forget this this uh, momentary lapse in judgment, which which luckily none of us have had. That's, that's all I got. That's that's unbelievable, Eric. Uh, thank you so much. That was absolutely amazing. Um, and you got through three cases, so that was phenomenal. Uh, we I want to make sure we get to some of the questions from the chat. Um, this came up a couple of times. Are you familiar with the spine jack? Uh, uh, for kyphosis reduction or and or kyphoplasty and Wendy, I think you're probably more you're definitely more familiar than than me as a surgeon uh, on some of these interventional techniques for for uh, vertebral bi uh, vertebral body height restoration and possibly kyphosis reduction. So this question is for either of you, Wendy or Eric. Wendy, no, well, you want to go first? No, Eric, you go first. This, yeah, I think there's more of a role for you than me here. So. I, you know, I, I think, so I, I guess I would be cautious. So the, the goal, what is the goal here? The goal here is for the fracture to heal. It turns out that bone heals to bone. It doesn't heal to cement or methamethacrylate or anything else that you're putting in there. So I would be a little bit cautious would be, would be my opinion. Um, I love the idea that, so I, I like perk screws. I like short segment fixation because I want the body to heal itself. And then I want to get out of Dodge. I don't want those implants to be doing stuff long term. Um, I'm not sure. I, I've never used the spine jack. Um, I have done kyphoplasty. Kyphoplasty for me is an, a great operation for an elderly patient with a simple compression fracture with back pain that fails non-operative management. It is a terrible operation and exactly the wrong thing to do for a burst fracture. Any posterior disruption, you're going to leak cement into the canal. You're going to injure someone and you'll never forgive yourself. And I would say that that would be absolutely the wrong thing to do. Yeah, I agree. Especially, I mean, obviously never if there's posterior column injuries, you know, nothing there. Anterior column, yeah, I agree. I don't think trauma is the right setting. Elderly osteoporotic fractures for sure and cancer. Sometimes when people, you know, that might be a better option for some of those patients. In Europe, they do a lot of things that we don't do here. They're very advanced with their kyphoplasties and armed kyphoplasty, which they can actually treat people with little fragments in the canal, and I, I don't understand it completely because I've never seen it in real life, but ligamentotaxis can pull them back in, apparently, and they're, they're doing these things. But again, not I wouldn't do that unless there was a compelling reason to do it instead of surgery, which is rare. Eric, I've got to share with you a, a recent case that I had the pleasure of revising, which was a, a woman 10 years out from one of those L1 burst fractures who unfortunately got treated with a, a posterior approach with a corpectomy and had a cervical corpectomy cage that was put in, expanded, but then wrapped and molded with methylmethacrylate and impacted into place where it was there was literally bone cement everywhere. And unfortunately, this was the third time she had gotten infected and the methylmethacrylate had seeded all sorts of bacteria and nasty bits and there was a psoas abscess. And the whole time as I'm drilling it out with the metal cutting burr, I'm thinking to myself, why would anyone ever do this? This is insane. I, I, I assume you sent the surgeon a thank you note and told him how, what a pleasure it was to revise their case. Yeah, it, it just doesn't make sense. So I, I, I agree. I think that for, all of, for, for everyone that does revision surgery, and as um, unfortunately as we get older, you get to do more and more revision surgery. Uh, a lot of it ends up being your own cases too, uh, so be very careful what you do because uh, you get to see your own mistakes again and again. Um, it just doesn't. Just be very cautious with that. Um, and you know, the common place where we see methamphetamine is in these tumor cases, and so we used to try to save some money and put methamphetamine in, and you know, a patients got lung cancer and they're not going to survive, so let's just do a quick. And and God dang it, so they come up with these interferon and, and anti-tumor blockers, and now they live for 20 years later, and which is great, the patient's alive, but now they've got a non-union and they've got fractured cement, and now they've, you've just taken a, a simple problem and really made it challenging. So, yeah, great point. That's, that's a great point. Uh, let's see, Wendy, do we have a bonus case? Were, were you gonna... well, do, we, do we have time? Do you guys wanna take it? I just put all the pictures on one screen so you don't have to do them separately. 
Let's do it. Let's do a quick bonus case, and this time we'll reverse uh, pimp. We'll go ahead and uh, pimp Dr. Kleinberg, our guest. I love it. I love it. Let's go. All right. Let's see it. Can you see that? Yeah. So extension yeah. injury. So pretend you're only looking at the top row first. <laughs> That's okay. So this was a lady who had been decompressed about 10 years ago, chronic back pain. She went and got injections every two months and she was at her little injection center and was walking up the stairs and fell down the stairs. And um, so the top pictures are, the, you know, they rushed her to the ER. And then the bottom, don't look at the MR yet. <laughs> anyway, so first of all, this person was decompressed with no, no hardware. Yep. Um, anyway, I'll let, I'll let you, somebody take the case if you want. So I, so I can hop in there. So, you know, decompression alone without instrumentation, totally reasonable, right? We still do a lot of that, I hope. Um, uh, still a pretty common uh, procedure for people that are, are well aligned. Um, she looks actually better aligned now with her injury than she did, my guess, preoperatively. And so she did a nice, uh, what looks to be an extension injury through that L4-5 disc space. Um, mm -hmm. I can't see exactly the injury of the facet joint, joints. She probably either has uh, I, my bet is the facet joints look fine, but what she has is pars fractures, because uh, that's the classic injury, because the pars get thinned out uh, when you do the decompression, and um, they'll just kind of uh, lean back and, and uh, crack right through it. Okay. So that's good. Yeah. So big disc also. She did have severe right leg pain. Um, yep. So originally, they thought these were chronic injuries. They were going to send her home. Um, there was a lot of Ooh. blood here. Not even in this picture, there was a lot more blood than there probably should have been just from a disc injury. Although I guess discs can have a lot of blood. I don't know. I didn't realize that. But um, so we got a CTA just to make sure she was okay. Ends up she was going to get surgery to put in hardware, but had some infections, abdominal infections, something like that, chronic. So that's another issue with this patient. Um, but we did get the MR, three column injury. How would you treat this one? Yeah, so th this is... Um... So good, good, tough case. So obviously, I for this one, I think this is uh, this is more of a it's a fracture, but it's also a fracture with a significant amount of degeneration. It's at, it's at a difficult spot too. So likely osteopenic or osteoporotic bone, uh, elderly female with a fall. This one for me, I would do a multi-segment fixation uh, with iliac bolts, and so this will get. Let's see, she's got degeneration four or five. Three, four looks bone on bone. Two, three is bone on bone. One, two, and then she's got an osteophyte above there. So I'm probably doing more like it would, it, even though it's a fracture, it would end up looking more like a deformity operation with a T9, 10, the pelvis with iliac bolts and fixation. I would try the one, the one bummer here is I wish I had some upright x rays to get a sense about what her alignment looks like so that I could dial in her alignment. But again, I would bet. That, that upper that first CT scan that you see in the top there, I would bet you that that is probably the best aligned she's ever looked, and that the other ones show her with loss of lordosis, kyphotic through her, her lumbar spine. So I try to dial that in. I would probably not uh, fill in that inner body space. I think that would be the good question. Do you need to fill it in? Do you need to do an inner body to help support it? I think I would do enough above and below. And my guess is with all that blood and everything else that that's going to want to heal together great. Okay. Eric, right. what about it? What about at L five S one? Would you do anything down there since you're doing kind of more of deformity operation for uh, for trauma? Yeah, it's a good question. I probably I probably wouldn't um, because it looks like it's it wants to fuse together, and so I hate taking something that wants to fuse and make it not want to fuse. Um, and for her, if I if worst came to worst, I I lined it up and it wasn't perfect, and I had to come back and do a revision operation. At least that fixed her fracture and protected her neurologic status. And so I, I, I try really hard not to mix my messages. So I tr if I'm doing trauma, I try to fix trauma. If I'm doing deformity, I try to fix deformity. I try not to do trauma deformity operations. This one, this one, you didn't give me any choice. So I've got, so you, you, this is a good sucker punch. I appreciate that, Wendy. Um, so, but, so I would, I would get better alignment, but I wouldn't go for perfect alignment. And what about um, for something like this, you know, three column, uh, what are your thoughts on multi-rod constructs? Yeah, so I, I'm routinely, you know, I, I, I should show you some of my deformity um, 
uh, X-rays now. They're they're in, they they have an embarrassingly large amount of metal, and so my typical constructs now are are four rod constructs with uh, quad iliac bolts. Uh, mostly because I've seen so many rod fractures at L5S1, I probably use uh, I would consider strongly consider using off-label protein to help this heal together. Uh, because again, I would be thinking about treating it like like a deformity operation more than uh, just a, a simple trauma operation.